Hi, everybody. It's Brooke Hudson here, the producer of Omaha Fashion Week. Thank you all so much for tuning in tonight. We've had a really great week of conversation so far, and we are very, very excited to hear from Takoon tonight. Um, as you guys might have read, Takoon is uh, somebody who grew up in Nebraska and was inspired by many of the things that he experienced here. And he's going to be talking a little bit about that and how he got into the fashion industry. Um, he's been mentored by Anna Wintour and even made uh, an appearance in the September issue, which is a really great fashion documentary. If you haven't seen it yet, make sure you watch that. Um, so really excited to have him. We're going to let him speak and share his story for about 20 minutes. And then after that, we'll open it up to questions. So feel free to start thinking about what questions you want to ask him and then type those in the chat. And you can even start uh, putting those into chat now or what, once we get started. So as those questions kind of bubble up in your mind, just go ahead and put them in there and we'll ask away. Okay, with that, I'd like to introduce Takoon. Hi, Brooke. Hi, thanks for being here. Yes, of course, of course. Thanks for having me. We wanted to talk to you for years, so this is very exciting. <laughs> Thank God I'm here now, right? <laughs> yes. Thank God for the pandemic. This might not have happened otherwise. So yeah, I know, I know. But, cool. Um, so to be here. So we want to hear all about your story, what it was like for you growing up in Nebraska, and how you ended up in the fashion industry. Yeah, of course, of course. So. Um, thank you again for having me uh, tonight. Um, it's really an honor and it's, it's sort of like, a, like a, a bit of a welcome home moment for me, which is really nice, especially in this time right now when we're all kind of like isolated and sort of like at home um, and not together with people. But um, so just to kind of like really rewind back, I guess, to, um, to, to when I was young and, and, and this is I haven't done this in a while, so um, you know I might stumble a little bit, but for, forgive me. It's a it's a it's a long journey. But um, so um, I uh, so basically uh, I was born and raised in Thailand, and um, we lived there until I was 11 years of age. And my parents are divorced, so I've always had family members in the U.S., uh, mostly in California, uh, and some obviously in uh, in Omaha, in Bellevue in particular, because of the Air Force Base. Um, and so, um, you know, um, I have one sibling, an older brother, he's a year older, um, actually 13 months. So we're kind of like Irish twins, basically. Um, and we were just the two of us just like running around Bangkok. We, we grew up in Bangkok and it was such a big, big, big city. Um, and we basically kind of like ran around uh, as kids ourselves, like we were on buses, we were all over the place. And so, um, you know, we really were exposed to um, a big, big city. Uh, when we were told that we had to move to Bellevue, Nebraska, we actually didn't know what that was going to be like. We were excited um, to go to America. You know, you know, everyone has to understand that America still is sort of like this sort of like beacon uh, of, uh, of a nation that people, you know, from all over want to be a part of. And especially at the time, I think it was around 1988, I want to say. Was eleven, um, you know. There weren't a lot of Asians in in Omaha and in Bellevue, and so when we moved there, it was really kind of um, like a sort of like a shock, you know, coming from uh, a big metropolis city like Bangkok and then going into Bellevue, where at the time there wasn't that much going on. There wasn't that much sort of like places to go to. Um, we lit, you know, there were a lot of cornfields. I think there are still some but not as much as back then I can assure you um, and so you know we really had to adjust very quickly um, you know we arrived in June I think it was a summer um, uh, and then we had to start school in a couple of months so we basically had to like really learn the ropes learn English do do all of that just to prep to go to school um, in doing that I sort of um, became very sort of I guess like um, uh, I became an introvert almost um, just because I was really nervous about sort of like, you know, meshing with other uh, people in the school. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any friends. I only had my brother. So it was just the two of us sort of like hanging out with each other. And so that sort of like made me go into myself and be become a bit of an introvert. 
thankfully I had enough of a creativity inside of me. And so that sort of like took a, a turn into kind of like books and magazines. So um, my sort of like weekends were not playing with other kids in school. My weekends were basically going to the mall with my mom and my brother. And what we would do is we would just spend maybe a couple of hours at the West Roads Mall or the South Roads Mall or, you know, uh, what have you. And then I would beeline to um, the bookstore or uh, the, where, you know, I, I forgot what, which bookstore, I think it was like, I don't remember which bookstore it was at the time, but it had the biggest um, magazine section uh, in Omaha. And uh, at that time, they were really stocking every magazine from every part of the world. So it was like, not just American Vogue, but it was Italian Vogue, British Vogue, French Vogue, like it was all sorts of magazines. I actually was really surprised that Omaha at the time had that extensive of a magazine uh, a representation. Um, and so I remember really just sitting around the newsstand and just pouring myself into those magazines. I actually started subscribing to GQ when I was in the in the sixth grade, you know, so like it was sort of um, really an early age. For some reason, I kind of took into fashion. You know, I think that like my mom was a seamstress growing up, and my grandmother taught me how to sew in Thailand. So I kind of was always around fashion. But for some reason, I think um, looking at those magazines in Omaha when there was actually sort of nothing to do, I was super bored. Um, looking at those magazines and all of those images, it kind of like was an escape for me. Like, you know, fashion was almost like a fantasy at that time. And so that's when I think I became really interested in fashion. And so um, I remember just like getting my subscriptions, going to the newsstands every weekend, buying my magazines, tearing out the sh spreadsheets uh, or the, uh, the, the spreads and then putting them on, the, uh, on my wall. And basically I like, I knew every fashion story, I knew every fashion photographer, I knew every designer, I like studied, it was almost like I just was consuming it so rapidly at the time. Um, and so, you know, at that point, I think my mom knew that I wanted to be in fashion. I kind of knew that I wanted to be in fashion, but um, I wasn't sure which way it was gonna land. You know, I wasn't uh, studying design at the time. I was just basically studying um, business actually. And so, um, the interest kind of basically took me into uh, a marketing realm where, you know, I was studying business in high school. Um, and then after high school, I got a scholarship to go to um, Boston University for, for business marketing. And that was sort of like, that was my way of kind of getting out of Omaha, if you will. Um, and so, you know, spent four years um, at the business school in Boston. Um, but at that time, I met a lot of friends uh, in New York. You know, a lot of the New York um, uh, kids were basically going to school in Boston at the time too. And so I developed a lot of friendships with um, a lot of uh, New Yorkers. And so what I would do is I would come to New York for the weekend uh, when we you didn't, didn't have classes. During breaks, I would come to New York as well. And even during the summertime, I would intern in New York. And so it was almost like I kind of, knew that New York was gonna be the place for me to be because I think that in the back of my mind, I knew that fashion was where I was gonna land. And so, um, you know, got my foot in the door uh, through some internships with a showroom when I was a freshman, like after freshman year in college, I got an internship with a designer. Um, I don't know if you guys know her, um, her name is Nanette Lapore. Back then she was quite big and I got an internship with her even though I didn't even have a design background. I just kind of like talked my way into it. Um, and um, I got another internship uh, with a magazine uh, which then ended up getting me in the door um, when I graduated college at Harper's Bazaar magazine. So um, after four years of college, basically went to uh, New York right away um, started working at J. Crew, uh, doing uh, everything from production, was promoted to merchandising. And then after that, I said, you know what? Like, I think that, you know, J. Crew is great. The clothes are amazing. I'm obsessed with the clothes. I wanted high fashion. Like, I, I, I was, I kind of 
I had my goal set to be doing high fashion because you know of all of the years uh, in Nebraska, just looking at all of these fashion stories. And so a friend of mine at the time was uh, working at Harper's Bazaar uh, magazine uh, as an accessories editor. And she said to Kuhn, they're looking for a writer um, in the fashion department. If you want to get in, just try to get in. Like, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. Like, you might not want to write, but it's a way in. And so I applied for the job, um, did three writing tests for them, and I got the job. And so that was really my first sort of entry into sort of high fashion, if you will. And so for me, that was sort of like the pinnacle of like success at the time. And I think I was like 24 um, years old. Um, and from then, I sort of, I learned a lot. Um, I assisted the fashion features director. I assisted the fashion, the senior fashion editor. I assisted about four people. They, they took, like, like they sent me out right away to cover fashion stories. They sent me out to parties to cover all the social parties in the beginning. And then they sent me out to interview designers right away. And it was such a, like, a, like it was a, like a mind bend because I couldn't believe that at such a young age that I was able to do that. And I think it was because I had shown right away that like I had really sort of extensive knowledge of fashion, even if I was that young. And I really attribute that to, you know, all of my years spending sort of like reading up um, about fashion and designers in Nebraska. Like really, I think that to me, like, I didn't go to a fashion school, but like, you know, being in Nebraska, like really like kind of like studying fashion was like, those were sort of my fashion formative years, if you will. And so, um, so I spent four years um, at Harper's Bazaar uh, uh, and I worked my way up from assisting uh, a stylist to fashion writing. I ended up having my own section in the front of the magazine at the time. I had like 10 pages that I was covering. Um, I was editing, I was copywriting. Um, and what I started doing was I was spending more time with designers that I was interviewing. And so, you know, they would give me a fashion straight and say, okay, Tukun, why don't you go and interview uh, so-and-so, um, you know, down in their studio. And I would go and I would basically spend more time than I needed to with them just because I was really enthralled by their work environment, their studio. I was really inspired by what they were doing in their studio, you know, I really wanted to kind of like really learn more about the, the, the process of creating clothes. And when, when, I, when that light bulb went off in my head, I was like, okay, cool. Like this is what I wanna do next. Like, I don't think that, I think that I'm done with writing. I wanna get into design. And so I started taking classes at Parsons in, uh, at, on nights and weekends while I was working still uh, as a fashion editor at Harper's Bazaar. And so spent uh, two years doing that. Um, so I really kind of learned the ropes from uh, uh, designing, sketching, apparel construction, pattern making, sewing um, really quickly. And uh, while I was doing that, I was also kind of like, showing other editors that I had known in the industry, my sketches, you know, and, um, you know, I would, I ran into Vogue and I was like, Sally, who was the fashion director at the time was like, Sally, what do you think of these sketches? She was like, amazing, keep going. And I would then, you know, go and show the fashion director Barney's at the time, um, who was sort of like the re premier retailer at the time. And I said to Julie Gilhart, I said, okay, Julie, what do you think of these sketches? She, she would say, they're amazing, keep going. And so I knew that I had enough creativity in me to kind of like start my own collection. And so um, then, you know, that was another, I think two years. So I, in, in total, I spent about five years at Harper's Bazaar. Um, after that, I said, okay, I'm gonna launch my own collection. And so that was around uh, September of 2004. Gosh, I can't believe that it's been that long. Um, so uh, September 2004, it was when um, literally I had about three weeks to put a collection together. You know, I had this window, uh, Julie Gilhart at Barney's was like, Takuda, if you want to do this, you have to do a presentation. 
um, uh, Vogue, the, the, the writer of Vogue was like, Takuna, if you want to be in Vogue, you have to do a presentation and we'll write about you. So I was like, okay, cool. Like, this is sort of like my entry in. Like, I have enough contacts that I've made along the ways. I'm just not going to put all of those ingredients together and make something. And so basically, I tapped my friends to help me uh, style. I had I tapped my friends to help me cast for the presentation. I had friends to help me photograph everything. We ended up putting together a collection of 10 looks. Um, I contacted a friend to like to, to, to give me a free space, a, fa a studio space to show in. I put the presentation together, um, put all of the money that I had into this. Like I, I basically like, I just was like, okay, this is my one chance I'm gonna do this. Um, at that time I had already quit Bazaar. So I was kind of basically not working. And I really didn't tell my mom that I was doing this either. So basically she really didn't know what I was doing at the time. And so um, put the presentation together. The day of the presentation was a nervous wreck. Uh, I didn't know if any was, anyone was gonna show up basically. The doors open, everyone showed up. It was like a mob scene, like basically like it almost got shut down because it was so packed, like jam packed wall to wall. All of Vogue editors came and like all of the magazines, Women's Wear Daily, everybody came. Um, the head uh, or the, the, the fashion director of Vogue came to me and said, this is amazing, Takoon. I need you to bring the collection up to show Anna Wintour tomorrow at her office. And at that moment, I was like, okay, like I can't even process what's happening right now. But I said, okay, cool, that's fine. You know, so we basically dismantled the collection. I spent the rest of the time basically just like cleaning up the, the clothes from, you know, from being worn by the models, pressing and everything, getting them ready for Anna Wintour. Went up to her office the next day. She literally gave me 10 minutes to, uh, to, to, to present to her. I had to basically get it all ready on a rack she comes in, she sits right next to me and she was like, she kind of really didn't even engage in small talk. She was like, okay, what do you have? And I just kind of like got up and like, I just remember shaking. And then like, I just like, I just like, like I started slow in the beginning, but then I just like, like composed myself. I got myself together and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna like do this because this is my only chance, right? And so I just presented really quickly to her. I talked really fast but I just presented really quickly. And she was like, great, that's great, great, great. Thank you, thank you, okay, bye. Like that was it. Didn't hear back for like maybe a couple of weeks. Then like three weeks later, you know, they call and said, okay, like we have a shoot with Steven Mizell and we wanna pull some of your looks for his photo shoot. And so at that moment, that's when it all kind of like, just like, just like went up from there. It's just. Stephen Mazel shot the look. Grace Coddington, who was at the time the biggest fashion stylist in fashion, styled the shoot. Um, then consecutively, I, I then I got a story in Vogue right after that, a feature story. Um, consecutively, every month I was in Vogue. Like it's just like it just blew up from there. Barney's picked up the collection, and then like it just snowballed from there. And then after that, Anna was the nicest person, like she basically would call me all the time. She would email and she would be, you know, saying, Takun, how are you doing? Just, you know, get ready for this ride. And just, you know, it's gonna be amazing. Don't worry about it, you're talented. Like she was like the biggest champion uh, of the collection. And, you know, if you have seen the, the September issue, you will, you will see that that's her genuine sort of uh, 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 sincerity coming out you know, for the collection. She was really pitching, you know, my brand and my name to everybody at the time. And so, you know, really, I owe a lot to, to Anna and Vogue, um, you know, in addition to everyone else in fashion at the time, because I, I really think that, um, you know, um, the community kind of rallied at the time. And, you know, fashion in New York is so fast and so quick, but they're always hungry for, for talent and for newness and for, for sort of energy. And so at the time I was really just kind of, just all like rolled up in this sort of, this machine. And so, so yeah, I think that that kind of really formulated my, um, my career. Um, she introduced me to the Gap, which landed me a Gap contract for a little bit. She introduced me to 
the Todd's group, which landed me uh, a creative director contract for two years in Italy. And, you know, I have a lot uh, uh, to thank uh, for, for, for with Anna. So, um, so yeah, that's pretty much the gist of, of my story. Um, and uh, yeah. <laughs> Wow, that that's incredible. I love. Um, I just. I, I think it's one of the things that really struck me about your story, is just how persistent you were in building relationships and having the courage to show your work in progress and ask for feedback mm -hmm. early in your process, um, and the fact that you got encouragement to continue on. So I think that's that's an interesting kind of thing for any young designers we have on the call right now to think about is do your sketches, don't be afraid to show your early work and ask for feedback along the way and just use that to continue to get better. Mind um, you, you know, my early sketches that I was showing to the retailers and the editors, if I look back at them now, they're basically chicken scratches. Like they weren't even that good. Like they were so crude. You know, I, I mean, I, I had loved doing art when I was younger. I was drawing all the time too, but you know, drawing fashion is different than drawing sort of portraits and, and doing, doing other kind of art. So, you know, I was still learning how to sketch. And so, you know, for me, like it wasn't that I was like, I wasn't shy about showing them just because I knew that like, you know, I needed criticism, right? Like I needed for people to see this, for, for them to actually give me opinion, because then that would allow me to understand exactly where I could fit into this and what I needed to do to get to the next level. So for me, it, I was never, I was never shy. Like, you know, like just because if you have an objective in mind, then, you know, you have to put that shyness aside, like put your ego aside. It's really, you know, focusing on what's ahead of you. Yeah, I mean, that's, it's incredible, especially like, you know, your, your confidence in doing that and considering that when you first came to Nebraska, you kind of mentioned that you were a bit more introverted. Um, so to be able to come out of your shell and do that and do it at the highest levels of the industry is just an incredible transformation. Um, so I think that, um, that, that's, that was the thing. Like I, I always think back fondly uh, about my time in Nebraska because I think that, you know, when you, there was a comp, there's an ingredient there that happens when, you know, you're at a young age, you're kind of vulnerable, right? Like, and you, you sort of are, you know, you become introverted for whatever reason, whether or not you, you know, you're not making friends or you're moving from a new city and you're, you know, you're shy, you know, at the time I was uh, you know, also sort of like, you know, uh, quiet about my sexuality just because I wasn't, you know, like you can't really open up at the time too. So all of these things kind of like, uh, you know, they form you in a way. And so creativity in Nebraska was almost like, like a breeding ground for like, it's like the quietness of Nebraska allowed me to really hear the creative voices that I had in my head. And so I really value that. Like, I think that if I had, you know, grown up maybe in like a, a like a bigger city where I was distracted because there were so many things to do, you know, where they were like, I can find friends easier. Like, I think that that maybe would have changed the trajectory of, of where I would be today. You know, like who knows, like if I was in Bangkok still, you know, being comfortable with my friends there, you know, speaking the language that I grew up, like was born to speak, you know, like maybe I wouldn't have turned into a fashion designer. So I really do think that, you know, I think that the right sort of environment fosters creativity. Yeah, wow. Yeah, so the quietness of Nebraska allowed you to kind of lay this foundation and you you dove in, you educated yourself, you absorbed as much as you could of the industry yep. from our, our cornfields here in Nebraska. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, okay, so we are starting to get some really great questions in the chat. So I'm just going to start reading those and you can just answer away. Does that work? Okay, are yep. you, can you hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. All right, so this is from Jen Lopez. How did you develop who your target market was? Uh, you were exposed to so many different people within the industry. Did they possibly influence that? So um, it's a really good question, just because I think that the fashion landscape has changed so much since when I first started designing to now. And I'll just give you my sort of my experience and my forte on what, what I know when I first started, which is when I first started, 
I wanted to be in high fashion. That was just like my ultimate goal. And in order to be in high fashion on the runway, you really need to really show up uh, for yourself. Basically, it's, exa- it's what you want to do. It's your creative expression that you need to output. It's really not about, like for me, like I never worried about the target audience. That for me, it was just a pure creative expression at the time, because at the time, that's what was going to get you to the top. You know, like if I worried about commerciality or selling, then I wouldn't have put out that much creativity in the beginning. And so if you aim to be the next, you know, um, Chanel or the next Gucci or the next Takoon or whatever, it's like, you've got to just kind of express yourself and what you can bring to the table. So, you know, whether or not like find your voice, right? Like if you're, you know, overt feminine, like just go for it. If you are, you know, minimalist, just go like, just find your voice. And then from there, you'll get the, the traction and the, the, the retailers who will then start to buy into your collection. And then from there, you can start to understand who your customer is and then develop for those customers. But you can't do that until you have your voice out there. Well, that's interesting because I think a lot of times in, in academia, yeah. they, they talk to students about you've got to have your target market. You've got to know who your demographics are. And maybe the discussion needs to shift towards finding your passion and your, your point of view as a yeah. creative first and then first, deal with right. the, the business later. That's I mean, I think, that's, I, I think it's a balance though too, you know? So, but I think that in that balance, creativity, creativity is first and then the, ba- the, the business part is second, but it has to be complementary to the creativity, you know? So let's say, but you know, like I think that every designer will have in the back of their minds, a sense of who their audience is or who they want their audience to be. You know, I think that, for example, like you can say, you know, like you, you know, if you just want to do evening wear, you know that that your audience is going to be mostly women who want to wear specialty dressing, you know, and who can't afford to do that. Right. So I think that's all like those two kind of go hand in hand. You know, if you're a minimalist at heart, you know, you know that maybe, you know, it's, uh, uh, you're designing something that's, you know, very classic and timeless. And you know that maybe the target audience is going to be somebody who might have like the row or Celine by Phoebe Philo from the past. So they kind of go hand in hand, but again, like you won't, you won't know that until you know what your creative output wants to be. Yeah, that makes sense. Wow. Okay. Here's another one. This is from one of our designers. Uh, she's asking, where do you find your inspiration? So, you know, I, I, I think that for me, it's, it's really everywhere, anywhere and everywhere. I mean, that sounds kind of cliche, but it's actually true. And, and, and I think that what I realize as I'm, you know, getting older is that I think it's about paying attention to all of those nuances and like, you know, like you can see things every day, but then there might be that one thing that you see that's like on the street that like kind of triggers something. It might be like something on the, you know, on the floor, or like on the sidewalk, or it might be, uh, you know, uh, an arrangement of flowers where one is kind of like wilting more than the other, like whatever, like it's almost like you have to really pay attention to everything you it, like for me like that's where I find my inspiration you know it's like literally you know when somebody is on the subway and the way that they wear their backpack with their dress to me triggers an inspiration you know I and then if then I'm on Pinterest and then I'm kind of like just kind of like lost in you know 80s fashion and then all of a sudden I see another backpack, but worn the same way that I saw the person on the subway. It's sort of like, then they all start to connect, right? Like, it's like, you kind of lean into the things that speak to you. But then for me, the magic happens when the things start to thread together. And then that's where the story starts to take shape a little bit. Very cool. 
Awesome. Okay, here's another one. This is uh, from Brianna Anderson. What is your most memorable runway experience while backstage? Oh my gosh. Okay, so. Give us the dirt. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> I, I don't, I think it was a fall collection. I don't remember which season it was actually. Um, it was when um, we were using uh, uh, a couture atelier in Paris at the time uh, and they specialize in feathers. Um, and this collection, like I really, it was almost like a collection based on like the twenties. And, and at the time I was really feeling sort of like the twenties kind of silhouette. Um, but I wanted it to be a little bit more sort of bespoke and couture. And so we, I had established a connection with this, um, this, uh, uh, feather house in Paris that Chanel uses. And I wanted to do pieces in feathers. Um, you know, and the, the 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 finale dresses would be decorated in feathers. So what I didn't realize was that it's not that easy to import feathers into the United States. Um, and so even if it's like, you know, like five feathers on a piece of garment, you have to kind of declare it with customs, but you have to do it with fish and wildlife certificate. And so, Literally, we were waiting for the dresses to come on like for the show that they hadn't arrived the night before. So we weren't even going to be able to fit those dresses. I think there were about three dresses at the time. We weren't even going to be able to fit the dresses. We knew that they were coming, that they were going to land uh, at uh, JFK in New York in the morning of the show. And we said, okay, that's fine. We'll, we'll deal with it. I think the show was like at 3 p.m. They were gonna land at like 8 a.m. And we said, okay, that's fine. We have plenty of time at the time to really do that. And so when they landed, I had my assistant and then two other girls just like be at the ready. Be like, okay, are, are the boxes here? Are the boxes here? Yes, they, yes they're here. Um, actually, we can't release the boxes because you don't have a fish and wildlife certificate. So we weren't going to have the dresses for the finale, but the kicker was that the dresses for the finale were already going to be photographed by Vogue immediately after as well, because like they had timed it for a story that they were doing in conjunction with the finale dresses with the 20 story that they were already planning. So like things were starting to fall apart. We weren't going to get the dresses. We didn't have the fish and wildlife uh, certificate. Literally we made miracles happen. The dresses showed up an hour before the show. We didn't fit them on the models. We just put them on the models and just like put them down the runway. So that was the most dramatically stressful show experience that I've ever experienced ever, ever, ever. <laughs> oh my gosh. That's, I mean, who would have thought, how would you have ever even known that you needed to have a fish and wildlife certificate that is crazy yeah I was so clueless at the time and it just you, you you never know right like you just think that like five feathers on her dress like what's the harm but you know <laughs> oh my gosh that's that is crazy I that's, I guess that's the way it is in in the industry you know we run into crazy things like that even here in Nebraska with permits and various things that you're like oh my gosh like I never would have thought I needed to know about yeah it's just it's crazy but also uh, when you're dealing with like um like the fedex people in uh, at the jfk airport in new york then they're pretty tough to deal with just because they've seen it all right like yeah. they, and so they're not they're not gonna bend rules because somebody is there saying i need these dresses for a runway show they're like please like i don't give a shit about your runway show you know right so, Oh, I bet those were interesting conversations those girls were having with those FedEx workers. <laughs> um, uh oh, I think he's frozen. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, this is from Marianne Vaccaro. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, yes. Okay, great. Yeah, I, I, you were frozen there for a second. Okay, this is from Marianne Vaccaro, and she's a, a longtime designer based out of Omaha and has shown in New York. Um, she's amazing. Um, did you have your fabrics, um, your trims, etc., purchased? And was your production lined up with all costs figured out when you met Anna? No. Um, my, my production and costs were not figured out at all. Like basically, 
at the time. I just, I, I mean, I knew my fabrics. I had, I, I did all of the purchasing myself. I, at the time I was like a team of like one, basically. I was working out of my apartment. I did the purchasing for the fabrics in France and in Italy, all of the trims. I ran uptown to, you know, we have a, the garment center here in New York and I was working very closely with our uh, seamstress and our factory. Um, you know, I basically just spent what I needed to spend in, in knowing that I needed to make the most beautiful garments possible. Um, did not even, un, didn't even think about costing at the time. And so when it came to actually selling the collection to Barney's and other stores, I think that we, I took a really big hit in the first season just because, you know, my fabrics were, I think like $60 a, a yard. You know, I was using lace at the time too, which was $110 a yard. And so clearly I lost money on that first season, but I knew that it was setting myself up for, you know, it was a marketing opportunity. It was a branding opportunity. So I took it. Yeah, you were establishing yourself. You had to make a splash. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so this is from Claire Thomas Morgan. Have you, how have you evolved your business over the past 15 years and what were the hardest moments? Yep, so, um, so you know, speaking about that time frame and fast forward, forwarding to now, I think that you can kind of, I mean, if you even look at the images, like it's clear that there has been an adaptation. And I think that there has been a shift in fashion in a very dramatic way in that I think that what was once uh, 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 to, like at the time, even it was like a smaller fashion industry, you know, now fashion is so democratic and it's so, it's ubiquitous, like it's everywhere. Like, you know, like there are like fashion week, there's a fashion week every week somewhere, you know? And so I think that from when I first started till now, people really, are more exposed to it than ever before. And I think that they're savvier and, 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 and sort of they, there are more sort of prices, price points to, 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 to enter into fashion than ever before. And so for me, I think that the biggest shift has been that, you know, I am in a point where I am not as focused on runway because I think that runway is more theater and I'm now much more focused on making clothes for women every single day. Like, I think that for me, you know, in, in, in a world where everyone is so busy and we all care so much about sustainability and we all care so much about sort of, you know, like timeless fashion and like things that like make you feel good, like reinterpreting what luxury means actually, um, that has made me think a little bit harder about the things that I wanted to do, to create, you know, in the past, again, like I would play with feathers all day long and sequins all day long. I still love to kind of do that once in a while, but I'm much more gratified when I'm creating simple, chic pieces that women can access. Like, you know, like I would design, you know, $2,000 dresses and I would go to these trunk shows or I would go to, you know, to meet with people like in Chicago, in LA, like in, you know, everywhere, Dallas. And, you know, I would have these women come up to me and say, I love your pieces, but they're so expensive. I can't, you know, like and, and at a certain point, it just didn't make sense to me anymore that, you know, why was I creating all of these beautiful pieces and only, you know, like a hundred people were able to buy them. Like it just didn't make sense to me. And so, I, and, and after, you know, working a little bit with The Gap and, you know, these other, you know, I even did a special project with Target at one time and, you know, really learning how that reach is so sort of gratifying and satisfying to be able to kind of really kind of like reach a bigger audience, like to me is more fulfilling. So that's, that's the shift that I've made and that's what we're doing now. So a lot of the pieces are really you know like like studied in terms of design but they're simple pieces now but the fabrics are really well made and they're from italy and they're from europe still you know and we have like we have it's like i get to play with all of the things i care about which are materials and, and design but do it in a way that makes sense for everybody well you know so i get targeted by your ads 
Oh, really? <laughs> like a year ago, I was getting targeted. I'm like, oh my gosh, someday I hope I get yeah. to talk to Takoon. <laughs> and here you are. It's great. So, well. <laughs> um, okay, so here's another question. This is from Sandra Starkey, and she's one of our U University of Nebraska at Lincoln professors. Um, please share your amazing experience as a designer that Michelle Obama personally selected to showcase her sense of style. How did that feel? It, it was that was a wild ride. So like if you know, I thought that the Anna Winter thing was a wild ride, and then once the whole uh, Obama factor came into play, it just took it another notch. Like really, that was a surreal moment. Just because um, you know, I think it was like the summer time frame when you know um, Barack Obama was running at the time. He was a candidate, and so. When that was starting to happen, I was contacted immediately by um, Mrs. Obama's stylist, and you know, and she said, "Listen, like, you know, I just want you to know that uh, Michelle Obama has been buying your pieces regularly for the past couple of seasons now. She's absolutely in love with them, and would you ever consider, you know, working with her uh, on special dressing?" Uh, uh, on the campaign trail. I said, absolutely, I'm happy to do that. So um, we were working behind the scenes on a couple of things, um, you know, but, you know, the caveat was that there was no way to know what she was going to wear. And, you know, this was, uh, this was a label of love, if you will, like, you know, it was almost like, if you want to spend time, you know, doing this, that's great. But like, we can't guarantee, you know, when she's gonna wear something just because like, you know, it's very like the schedule is very demanding and it, like the, the weather changes every hour, right? So I was like, fine, that's great. So we created a couple of, um, I think it was about maybe five different looks for, for Michelle Obama at the time. Um, you know, I just was like, you know what, never expected anything at the time. Also, I was quite, I was, I think we were sort of doing a lot for Vogue and this, like, I don't know if it was the September issue, maybe not, it, but that, that was right after. So it was like the trajectory of that, like I was really inundated. We were glow, growing so fast internationally. And so I said, okay, fine, let's just do this. Um, I remember that I was watching, because I was glued to the television with the, you know, with, with their campaign and his nomination. And it was such a, um, an overwhelming time just because um, you know, being an immigrant, being an American immigrant, you know, like that's the story that you want to see. That's the story that like you read that that resonates with you. And at the time, I know that she was championing a lot of, you know, um, young um, in, immigrant Americans too, you know, and so I was glued to the television, uh, the, the night of um, sort of like the, uh, I, I think it was like that week of the convention. Um, it was the closing night. It was his acceptance night. Uh, no, no, it was like a, it, I, I think it was like a Tuesday night. Um, I was watching and talking to my friend on the phone. And then I look on television and I see her in the balcony with her daughter, one of her daughters in her lap. And she was like, I saw her from the top. Uh, and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Like I didn't, I, I, I was like, wait, I think that's it. Like, I, I couldn't believe it. And then all of a sudden, my phone just started ringing. Like, it just kept ringing, just kept ringing. Like, I, I found out on, tel like, live television. And it was just a surreal moment. It was a surreal moment. You know, but, but I was getting a call from, like, Good Morning America. I was getting a call from, like, the Today Show. Like, it was just, like, a surreal, like, everyone called at the time. It was, like, the biggest news. So when I say trajectory up from Anna Wintour, it was definitely that. Wow, that yeah. is incredible. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I bet your heart was just pounding. <laughs> no, it was, it was it was an incredible. And then from then on, we kept making more stuff for her. You know, we made stuff for her uh, inauguration. It wasn't picked because now I realized that I should have lined the the coat. Like I I I, I wanted to use this um uh this uh, this special fabric from Paris that I had made. It was a jacquard. It was beautiful, but it was it. You know, that day, I remember it was really cold. That's why she didn't wear it. But then she ended up wearing that outfit later on when she went to Paris and, and she met with the uh, Sarkozy's at the time when he was um, the, the, the prime minister. Oh, that's awesome. Oh my gosh, history. I mean, you're now a part of history. I know. <laughs> so cool. Great. 
Um, okay, so this one is from Christy Christ. From your time at Parsons, which classes have been most valuable to you now? Yes, this is a good one. I love talking about this. Um, uh, apparel construction is really good. It was a really intensive class. I basically went uh, for three hours every Saturday. And it was, it, it was a class where it literally taught you how, like to, how to make a pattern and to take a pattern and, and, and drape and then sew. Like it was really an intensive class and I did that for about three months. And so um, that I think was the most valuable, valuable class for me. I had learned how to sew when I was younger and I, I knew how to, to work the sewing machine. So, you know, like I got like a, like a, like a, like a refresher during that class, but you know, I, I don't sew now just because, you know, there are seamstresses that can do a better job than, than I can. Um, but to have apparel construction when you actually can understand how to take a pattern, to drape, to, you know, to, to finish garment, I think that's the most important. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and then um, what are some ways that you keep up with the trends while staying true to your brand and style? Uh, um, you know, You, you know, when you get into fashion long enough, you, you start to realize, I, always, I had doubts in the beginning, you know, I was like, oh, am I like, am I supposed to be a fashion designer? Do I have it to be a fashion designer? Because I remember when I was younger, Tom Ford said something one time that was like, my job is to know in a year in advance what you're going to be wearing. And so, you know, I was always in, my, in the back of my head, like, am I gonna know a year in advance what everyone's gonna be wearing? And so in the beginning, there was always question about that. But then as time went on, you know, I realized that I didn't need to think about that. It was just really, if you are in tune to culture and to everything and the trends around you, like a good designer will always know when that trend is going to expire and when the next one can come up. And so it's just really sort of like keeping up with the current and sort of, it's like surfing. Like you just gotta like, when you're on that board of fashion, you kind of like just need to assess, you know, the, your foundation a little bit. And then, you know, and then you know that like, ah, okay, like the cycle of trend happens like this and then it's gonna die down at this time. And so, you know, for me, that's, that's sort of like the balance. That's interesting. Just two nights ago during an, another discussion we were having, we kind of talked about this idea that some aspects of the industry require you to be thinking about what's in the future, like what's six months ahead or a year ahead. Um, but then other things require you to be extremely present. Mm -hmm. um, and for you as a designer, it sounds like you have to have a mix of both. You've got to be thinking about the future, but you have to be so immersed in the present and what's happening here and now, exactly. even though or have a sense of what's coming up. Exactly, and you know, social media doesn't help. Social media actually has made things faster and make things expire quicker too. So that's the thing that you have to really kind of pay attention to too, not too much, just because when you start to pay attention to everything on social media, then that's gonna be the death nail to your, you know, to, to your career, I think. For me, I think like, I'll give you an example, you know, like I think that everyone has been talking about lounge for the past year, obviously because of COVID and I think that you know, like, you know, everyone is saying, okay, summertime is going to be the time, you know, this was like four months ago. Summertime is when everyone's going to break away. Everyone's going to want to dress up again. It's going to be great. Like, we're going to go back to normal. Like, but that I know is an unrealistic time frame. Like, that's just like optimism, which is great. We all need to be optimistic, but summer is like literally like a month away. And do we think that we're actually going to be at a point where we actually are going to be doing that, I don't know. Like I, I just think that we're not there. I'm not ready to give up my sweatpants. But that's what I'm saying. So exactly. Like, <laughs> I, like, but that's me as well. Like I sit at home and I, you know, I can, you know, I have retailers saying, you know, I think we're we're gonna buy less lounge because we want, we want to buy into like special occasion tops, you know, going out like clothes. And I said, actually, I'm not giving up my sweatpants yet. And I think I bet you nine out of 10 people that I know are not ready to give up their sweatpants. So the question is, is not giving up your sweatpants. The question is, how do we dress up those sweatpants a little bit to make it feel like it's going to the next phase? So 
in essence, that's exactly what I'm doing now with the new collection for us. It's like, okay, you, you can still wear your sweatpants, but how do you wear your sweatpants with a cool trench coat with some belt or like, you know, make it, dress it up to make it actually cooler looking than just like you just rolled out of bed. Elevated sweatpants. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Okay. So here's one from another one of our designers. Do you have any tips for getting into the New York fashion industry? I, um, you know, I, I, I keep saying this, it's, it's a conviction of your point of view. Like, you know, like you better have as clear as much as possible your point of view, like what is your POV, you know, and, and know and, and stick with it, you know, but, you know, like really also, again, like coming back to what we were talking about in the beginning, like really, you know, suss it out, you know, get some advice and, and, and say, okay, like, you know, like, like, what do people think of it? You know, kind of like get it, like, like test it first before you actually just like launch into it, you know? And, and I think being humble is a good trait to be, to have, you know, like, don't be cocky, don't be overconfident, you know, be confident about your passion, but don't be overconfident about knowing that you think that you are like the, sh like the shit or you, that you know it all, you know, just really sort of be, be a little humble because I think that um, that will, will get you a long ways. All right, and then here's the final question. Um, how important are sewing skills in creating a collection, especially as your career advances? As you mentioned, you don't do a lot of sewing at this point. You have seems- I don't, but I know, I know sewing um, techniques. So, you know, in the beginning, I, I studied it. So I know what the techniques are. And, you know, I, those are the, I, those details do matter. You know, like if you're sewing silks or chiffon, you know that like, you know, the level of like sewing, like the stitching has to be lighter. Like, you know, what kind of thread to be using in order to make that piece of chiffon sing a little louder. And so, you know, or, you know, if you're doing uh, an outerwear piece and the stitching is not strong enough or it's not, it's not beefy enough, like there are these nuances that you know that can turn a garment from, from dull to, to excitement. So, I think sewing knowledge is important, you know, and in the beginning, you know, like I was playing a lot with like sort of uh, an offhanded way of like sewing, like, you know, like zigzag stitching, for example, um, was just used to like finish like a garment quickly, but then I used it to like trim or I used it to make a statement. So like the ways that you play with sewing can actually turn something into something completely different. One final thing, I, we had one designer or one student ask if, if, if students wanted to get in touch with you, are you willing to allow them to reach out to you? Yes, of course, yeah. just, uh, just, um, just DM mm -hmm. and then that's the best way because it's really like that it's faster and um, we can definitely, yeah, I'm happy to. And I oftentimes do uh, Q and A's to on, um, on our Insta story Okay. And so, you know, like sometimes we collect a lot of um, uh, questions and then I just do like a round of like answers on, on Insta story as well. Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's a good platform to do that, so. That's great, awesome. Thank you so much for making yourself available um, to, to continue the conversation on Insta. Nobody asked about Nebraska, that's the- No, I'm shocked. I know. What? Wanted okay, to well, come you know, like, the what were your favorite thrift stores? Just real quick. Uh, the Goodwill in, in South Omaha was one of my favorite. Like I went there all the time. Um, I used to hang out at the Antiquarium. You know, I, I consumed a lot of used books and used like uh, uh, um, tapes and, and, and records too. So I went to the Antiquarium all the time. But the thrift store, the Goodwill on, uh, on uh, I think it's like 24th Street or in South Omaha was, that, that was my favorite. Awesome. And do you have any other great spots that you remember and you enjoyed or, or that you, when you do come back to Nebraska to visit that you, you like to make sure you go to? I, I mean, I always go to Bellevue just because I grew up in Bellevue. I went to Bellevue West um, and, you know, I just love the town. People are really nice. I still have friends there that I go out with, um, you know, from time to time. Um, yeah. So Bellevue is, is my jam. <laughs> Oh, you have to come see us the next time you're here in Nebraska. Definitely, definitely. <laughs>
Cool. Well, thank you so much for taking time tonight. Do you have any last minute comments or things you want to add before we wrap up? No, this was really fun. Thank you so much. And yeah. Thank you. You've just yeah. been amazing and just such an honor to finally, after all these years, get to see you on screen and be able to speak to you. It's awesome. Um, so before we wrap up tonight, I just want to remind everybody that we still have three more days of programming. Um, tomorrow night and Saturday night, we're going to be showing our entire August season for the first time online. So you've seen little clips here and there, but we've never actually shown the entire thing. So you'll get to see that on Friday and Saturday night and that will be on Instagram. So just tune in there. And then on Sunday, we have 10 hours of fashion designers taking over our Instagram and they're going to be selling their works and kind of sharing what they're working on. Um, and it's our replacement for Shop the Runway Sunday since COVID sucks, we can't do that. Um, so that is a way, if you're interested in buying some of the work from our local designer, please tune into that. We'll have a new designer coming up every hour for 10 hours on Sunday. Okay, well, thanks everybody. And we look forward to seeing you um, throughout the rest of this week. And then we will hopefully, fingers crossed, be back in person on the runway in August. Thank you guys. Take Thank care. You.